What if the exceptional works of countless artists throughout the ages were not produced by their talents alone? That is the subject of the book Secret Knowledge by British painter David Hockney, in which he carefully analyses hundreds of famous paintings and matches shifts in style and technique to new optical technologies of the ages. This premise naturally caused a bit of a stir at the time. The book examines many different methods and is well worth reading yourself, but of all that was discussed, it was the little device on the cover that really caught my attention. Camera Lucida. Of all the technologies discussed in the book, Camera Lucida is, in my opinion, by far the most magical. A prism encased in shining brass that could magically impose an image onto any surface for its user. A tool that would not look out of place in the office of a mage or wizard. A device that could turn anyone into an artist, as advertising material throughout its existence has consistently used as a selling point. But what exactly is a camera lucida? How did I reimagine it for the modern age? And can it turn me into an artist? To answer that first question, I reached out to Pablo Garcia, professor, maker, and the co-inventor of the Neo Lucida, a modern recreation of this centuries-old tool. Oh, hello. Hello there. Hello. Seems like we're all online. There we go. Excellent. So I am Pablo Garcia, professor of art and design at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Part of my interest in drawing has to do with the relationship of art and technology and uh, kind of a history of art and technology. So not just computers and digital art, but rather how machines and mechanism and optics and science have all played a role in making art. Maybe you're familiar with camera obscura or the idea that some artists in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance time used optical devices to help them make more realistic drawings. Ten years ago, I was talking with a fellow art professor, and we were talking about camera lucidas, which are a, a lesser known optical device that helps people draw. Uh, now, camera lucida, and this is a vintage one from the 1840s, uh, what you have is a prism uh, on an adjustable stand, and, these, and you clamp this stand to a board. And when you look down into this prism, your vision is split. And so what you see in front of you is seems to be projected onto your page. Um, and so that arrangement was the original arrangement in 1807 when it was first invented by the Scottish chemist William Hyde Wollaston. And so this very simple prism uh, does the effect fairly well. This is a vintage prism. It's just nice solid glass. Contemporary versions would have slightly nicer glass, but it's basically just internal reflections in a glass prism. Once people start to realize that the prism, which is was an expensive and difficult thing to manufacture precisely, uh, wasn't the only way to do it, there was also an option to make a mirror and glass. Now, in the 1840s, a couple different people designed camera lucidas that had a mirror and glass arrangement, and it changed uh, the optical system with the same effect. Now, this, what I have here, is from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the Magic Art See and Draw Copier. Now, this is effectively a toy uh, marketed to young people in the back of pulp magazines and comic books. Um, and you can see that the optical arrangement is the same idea, like the person is looking down into this eyepiece and they're seeing what's in front of them projected onto their page. Uh, and what it is, is this, this is just kind of simple plastic. This is a kind of cheap piece of glass. And inside, if you can kind of see, uh, there is a mirror in the back. And so the arrangement from the side is this this glass piece is at 45 degrees. This back surface is a mirror and you look down into the, the hole here. And what that does is you look down in and you're looking through the glass to your page, but part of your vision is hitting the glass, reflected back onto the mirror and then back out again through the glass. And so there's your double bounce. Now this type of design is called a see-through camera lucida because you're actually seeing through the optical device. You're not splitting your vision. And what this does is it allows you to trace directly from real life. And that is a really huge technological advancement because one of the challenges when you're drawing realistically is you look at your subject, you look at your page, you can't look at both at the same time. And so drawing can be difficult because you're trying to remember what you're seeing and placing it onto your page. So a device like this allows you to see your real world image 
on your page. We'll hear more from Pablo in a minute, but hopefully now you've got a pretty good idea of what Camera Lucida is and how it works. Now, understanding the see-through variety, you can probably see how printing one should actually be pretty simple. I could model two pieces of glass in a box in like a minute or two and it would work, but I had some further design goals. Specifically, I wanted something portable, and that's the one lacking feature of all the existing designs. They all needed a table to be used. I'm a pretty avid traveller, and the idea of being able to sketch the landscapes I travel through was appealing to me, so I wanted a version that could be easily transported and set up. And to that end, here's what I made. Is there anything better than a case with a spot for everything? Inside this case is all the parts to set up and use this camera lucida. The optical component is stored flat in the case, but quickly folds together and uses a latch to take its appropriate form. I put this back in the case, and then go to extend the arm which mounts the camera lucida above your drawing surface. Extending this, I tighten it in place, and then mount the optical component to the arm. And just like that, it's set up and ready to use. Using the case as a stand is my solution to making the device portable, and you'll see how that works in just a minute. Aside from the obvious components, the case also contains an ND filter, a lens cloth, and the parts to clamp it to a bench or table, although I have found this to be mostly unnecessary. There's also a couple of optional laser cut components, including the wood inlay on the outside of the case, and the felt inserts in all the compartments. The design was inspired somewhat by the box's original camera Lucidas came in. It's slightly longer than my A5 notebook and fits unobtrusively into my bag, making this here all the equipment I need. So that's my design, now let's move on to some historical examples and then we'll go into my own testing and see how that went. What I find more interesting than the kind of oh, what famous artist used it and is it cheating and all this kind of like weird emotional attachment we have to kind of the great works of art was the fact that it was used very practically by an incredible array of architects, scientists, designers, archaeologists, uh, and basically people who were trying to capture things realistically for a purpose. So there's an incredible list of people who are not exclusively artists who are using the tool because up until the 1840s and 50s, this was the way to capture highly realistic, accurate details in proportion for uh, industries that required that kind of precision, the sciences and, and uh, archaeology surveying and those kinds of things. And so Frederick Catherwood is a great example of a British architect and artist who went along on an exposition to Central America in the 1830s. And he had this camera lucida and made these incredible images of these archeological ruins. And so his travels in Mesoamerica from the 1830s and 40s were bestsellers. These were massively famous books that showed these far off uh, places. Similarly, um, I think there are some really charming examples of more amateur artists. Uh, Captain Basil Hall, who was a retired British naval uh, officer, traveled to North America in the 1820s with the camera lucida. And his drawings are amateurish. And I don't mean that as an insult. I actually mean them as he was using the tool in a way that was suddenly possible, meaning he was capturing vistas of a young uh, America. You know, the country is only about 50 years old at this point, and he's capturing... These, these portraits of people in their local dress, both indigenous peoples as well as kind of the, the fur traders and the, the laborers and people in fancy dress, buildings and vistas of, you know, port cities and all that. But also there's an incredible world of natural scientists who started using these for capturing very accurate drawings of flora and fauna. Uh, the most famous example probably is that um, the Audubon uh, books of the birds in America were done as these massive elephant folio books, these incredible, huge drawings uh, that were these beautifully painted uh, drawings. 
Now, Audubon, when he realized that the, the success of the book could continue if he made a smaller edition, charged his son, John James Audubon, with a camera lucida to use it as a copy stand and actually take his father's drawings and reduce them into smaller drawings that could then be reprinted into an octavo size edition, so a much more portable and affordable edition. And so the camera lucida was, is used both out in the field and in research laboratories by scientists drawing plants, flowers, birds, uh, et cetera, specimens. And then also as a copy stand to take drawings of birds and scientific uh, artifacts and reduce them uh, into smaller drawings that then could be published. For my own tests, I did both landscape and studio experiments. For a benchmark, here are what my usual pencil sketches look like. They do the job for my design work, but safe to say I'm pretty much rock bottom when it comes to drawing ability. To begin with, I set up a pine mushroom in my studio. The camera exaggerates how dark the room is, but I set up the mushroom to be brighter than my page to get the clearest image. Using Camera Lucida was an interesting experience. I would consider myself an alright photographer, but capturing images on a camera these days feels kinda cheap to me. I might take hundreds of images in a day, so of course some of them will look great. The fact that everyone has a camera, always and everywhere, and new tools like AI image generation has certainly devalued digital images for me. Capturing these analogue images was a very cathartic experience that I enjoyed quite a lot. In Secret Knowledge, Hockney draws a rough graph showing art moving away from realism due to the advent of photography. Realism wasn't as special as it once was, and artists wanted to stand out. I wonder if, like with vinyl and film photography, we will see a rise in the popularity of traditional art mediums, as artists seek new ways to show their ability that won't be under so much scrutiny. I had two goes at the mushroom, and you can see that even between these two, there was considerable improvement. Moving on to the landscapes, I can report that my design worked as intended. Sitting cross-legged, I was able to draw in my lap comfortably. My first attempt, however, was unimpressive, to say the least. It was a pretty poor choice of landscape to start with, and had few distinct shapes to really mark out. Next, I tried to sketch a building in the city, and you can see that this actually went pretty well. I was able to clearly mark out the shapes of the skyline, and it's obvious what's being depicted. I wanted to do more landscapes, but it's winter in Australia, and I've struggled to find good windows to go outdoors. So no, Camera Lucida did not instantly make me into a master artist. However, I don't think these results are terrible either, certainly a big improvement over my usual mess. I think with just a little more skill in shading, I should be able to produce a decent image, and I'll continue to practice over the coming months. Now, after that, you want to try Camera Lucida for yourself. What are the options? Firstly, there's the Neo Lucida range that Pablo sells, and these are probably your best bet. Not too expensive, excellent optical quality, and well reviewed. Of course, there's my own design, which is free to download and costs around $20 to make, but has lower optical quality and lots of parts to make and assemble. It also has the added bonus of its portable design, which you won't get anywhere else. Finally, I'd also like to mention this other printable option by Felipe Sai on Thingiverse. Not compact like mine, but much easier to build. So if you just want a cheap and easy project to try, this might be the way to go. But yeah, that's pretty much the video. Build guide, print files, and other links will all be found in the description down below. The rest of the video is just some information that I thought was too interesting to leave out, but didn't really fit elsewhere in the story. So. Thanks for watching, and I'll leave you with that. Now, the strange thing, of course, is that the the camera lucida's period of, of of importance is brief because once the photo once photography is invented and people start using that, that becomes the the way that people document the, the world. And because the form factor of the original cameras looks more like a camera obscura, a box with a lens sticking out in the front, the camera lucida as a design kind of seemed to fall away. Um, there is an amusing anecdote about the history of photography and the camera lucida. Uh, one of the great users of a camera lucida was uh, Sir John Herschel, 
who was the great astronomer and was sent by the British Empire to various places around the world to set up observatories and gigantic telescopes. Um, he went to South Africa and was traveling all over the world building observatories. Uh, and he used to bring a camera lucid around with him. And if you look online, there are these incredible drawings that that Herschel wasn't using them necessarily as surveying drawings, but he was just such an incredible technical artist that he was drawing these beautiful landscapes of South Africa, of parts of Europe, um, as he's traveling around and doing these works. Uh, on holiday in the 1830s, uh, he was with his good friend, William um, Henry Fox Talbot. And Talbot loved using the camera lucida. And they're in, on holiday in Italy. And Talbot sets up his camera lucida. And he tries to draw. And his drawings are terrible. And he admits this. And he even says, like, oh, you know, I look inside this prism and I see this beautiful image of the world in front of me on my paper. I draw and then I look at my drawing and it's just not the same. I wish there was a way to capture what I see inside this eyepiece and just fix it to paper directly and leave me out of it because I can't really do the drawing. And this was the, 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 the beginning of the search for a chemical solution to photography. And Talbot would spend 10 years working on a solution to the chemical problem of fixing an image onto paper. And so weirdly, the camera lucida, which was a tool that was such a vital part of drawing realistically, was the inspiration for its own obsolescence. Because once Talbot kind of figured out, like, what I want to see in here, I want to fix on paper. And after figuring out a chemical way to fix the paper, the, the image to paper, the camera lucid became obsolete because now you had photography. Secret outro, yeah. Glad that at least somebody is still listening. This video was a lot of work, but also a lot of fun to make. So I'm glad that some people found it interesting enough to watch the whole way through.